maps. So it's a pleasure to be here, and I was, as I was putting this talk together, I was looking at some pretty high-powered stuff, and my wife said, uh, David, you're not speaking to an audience full of neuroscientists. So I thought, well, before I talked about advances, I should basically lay some groundwork, because I really don't know what the audience is comprised of, but I suspect we have some artists and musicians and hippies and people that maybe are not neuropharmacologists. So what I'm going to do is lay a little groundwork that leads up to it and then talk about a couple of the things that we've done, some of the problems that we've encountered and maybe how we've approached them. <clears throat> and the general overview of the talk is as follows. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the chemistry. How can we study psychedelics without using humans? And this is a question everybody might wonder. And I'll tell you how we do it and, and its limitations. And what are the receptor targets in the brain? We know quite a bit about that. Uh, and what and where are the receptors located? And then I'm going to talk about some new things that we're looking at with respect to LSD, which is a unique compound in this category of psychedelics. So the common misconception of psychedelics is something like this. <laughs> Tell the average guy on the street that you're interested in psychedelics, and immediately it's some kind of a weird uh, mental meltdown that they think of. <clears throat> and of course, the people here don't need to be told or uh, lectured to about that this is really not uh, what we're looking for. I like this definition. This was in Goodman and Gilman's uh, pharmacology handbook uh, in the eighth edition. This is the Bible for pharmacologists. It came out for one edition and uh, it didn't, and they changed the definition after that. Maybe they didn't like it, but I like it. It was written by uh, Jerome Jaffe. The feature that distinguishes psychedelic agents from other classes of drugs is their capacity reliably to induce or compel states of altered perception, thought, and feeling that are not or cannot be experienced otherwise except in dreams or at times of religious exaltation. When I teach the pharmacy students about psychedelics, I give this as a definition for the class. And many of you know there are things like beta blockers for, and antihypertensives and antibiotics. and Those things have very specific descriptions. And you give this as a description of a pharmacological class, and anyone with any training at all will recognize this is pretty unusual. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to illustrate a few events that I think are important in the recent so-called renaissance. Uh, this is an adaptation of a slide I use at Horizons, and you'll forgive me if I put some of my own accomplishments up there. <clears throat> the most important thing to notice is I've got these grouped by decades. And so you see in the 60s we had Walter Pankey completing his PhD thesis on the Good Friday Experiment, and Sasha publishing uh, with uh, Tony Sargent and Claudio Naranjo, structure activity relationships of one ring psychotomimetics. And that's what we called them back then, psychotomimetics, because they mimic psychosis if you took them, made you crazy. And then uh, uh, Panky and Grove published their first paper. I was a graduate student. I was just graduating in 1973 and patented a method for making hallucinogenic amphetamine isomers so that they became available for researchers. Then Sasha and I published the first report in a, a book that night, from a NIDA proceeding about MDMA. Then in the 1980s, we had the Esalen Conference on MDMA that Rick Doblin was heavily involved in and sponsored uh, to try to find a way to keep MDMA from being scheduled. That's where I actually met Rick. <clears throat> and then he activated Earth Metabolic Labs, a, a, a foundation that had uh, gone uh, dormant, and used that as a vehicle to start uh, doing some things. And then I met Rick Strassman uh, at that meeting, and we began to dialogue about his DMT study. And then in 1986, uh, Rick Doblin called me and said, I want to make MDMA into a drug, but nobody will make it for me. So I said, well, I'll make it for you. So uh, we uh, made two kilos, uh, did a pretty good deal on that one. <clears throat> <laughs> I think it cost uh, $1,500 a kilo. Uh, and that was with the paperwork for FDA. So it was a pretty good deal. And then uh, uh, George and Rico Talbert report on MDMA in the Journal of uh, Psychoactive Drugs. That was kind of an interesting thing. It was sort of the first legitimate publication on a utility for this. And, uh, and then, I, I, 1986, 
I was concerned that MDMA was going to become classified, and the government people were saying it was just another, psych just another uh, hallucinogenic amphetamine. I didn't believe that. So I proposed this name, Intactogen, and said, this is a different class. And we published a series of papers showing, using chemistry, that MDMA could not be a hallucinogenic amphetamine. It had too many structural divergences. It was a representative of a novel a pharmacologic class. And then Rick founded uh, MAPS in 1986. 1990, um, we synthesized the first batch of DMT for Rick Strassman. 1991, the Shoguns published Pical. Uh, the Hefter Research Institute was founded in 93. Rick Strassman published his human studies on DMT in 1994. And then Charlie Grobe and his colleagues published on the human psychopharmacology of Awaska based on their studies of UDV in, in Brazil. And then uh, Franz Wollenweider and uh, Felix Hosser published on the pharmacokinetics of psilocybin, which was really nice. It showed a lot about plasma levels and correlating that with the activity of these drugs. <clears throat> and then the Shulgans published TCAL. Franz Wollenweider showed that you could block the effects of psilocybin in man with ketanserin, which was a specific serotonin 2A antagonist. A lot of animal studies had suggested that was the key receptor, but until Franz actually did that experiment, we didn't know if that was true in humans. So that was really the proof that the serotonin 2A receptor was a key receptor. Then uh, I became interested in trying to find a better way to make psilocybin because um, the Hefter Institute and other people were interested in getting psilocybin. And there was a, a key step in that that uh, Albert Hoffman had developed. There was a reagent that you had to use that could spontaneously detonate. And my technician was not particularly interested in making that reagent. So uh, he spent some time and we found a better way to make it and published it. Uh, and that made it more accessible for clinical use. <clears throat> And we used that uh, procedure to make psilocybin for the Griffith study. And then, uh, as you know, Roland published, and then I went to the 2000, uh, the next decade, Roland uh, published this paper showing spiritual experiences with uh, psilocybin, a, a landmark breakthrough paper that, as you know, got a lot of coverage. Uh, Francisco Moreno published a study on the safety of psilocybin and OCD. Then we had the Supreme Court up upholding the injunction against the DEA, preventing them from confiscating a wasca from the church. Many of the people here in this audience, and myself included, uh, testified or wrote briefs on behalf of the UDV, and you know that the UDV prevailed there. Um, and then Griffiths uh, published a study showing the long-lasting effects of psilocybin at 14 months. Really remarkable. These uh, positive personality changes persisted. It's permanent. It's not something that just happens while you're taking the drug. The Grobe study of psilocybin in cancer patients was completed. It's been through two versions of revision. It's sitting at Archives of Pharmacology or Archives of Psychiatry. Uh, we think it's going to be accepted. That'll be another landmark paper. You know, Michael Mithover's study of MDMA, you saw the data there was completed. That's sitting at a journal of psychopharmacology. They're expecting uh, acceptance of that. So we're going to have a couple of papers probably this year on these. <clears throat> uh, my son, Charles Nichols, is actually a professor doing serotonin work at LSU, and we've talked about uh, starting the Nichols serotonin dynasty. But uh, <clears throat> I, sent him a sample, I sent him a sample of DOI, which is a hallucinogenic amphetamine because when he started LSU, he didn't have a license to work with Schedule I uh, substances, and DUI wasn't scheduled. And he had a Chinese postdoc that had been working in another lab looking at cardiovascular inflammatory processes, and they had some cells that they used for this assay, and he asked uh, Charles and uh, my son, what about if I test DUI in that? And my son laughed and said, well, sure, go ahead, because it's a hallucinogen, it's gonna do anything in cells. Lo and behold, it turned out it blocked the inflammatory response, completely blocked this inflammatory response in these radiotic cells. And so they patented this. So, and the, the funny thing is, the concentration to block that inflammatory response is 20 picomolar, which is way below the dose that would produce any psychoactive effects. LSD has the same effect, other psychedelics do, but they're not quite as potent as this. So it makes you wonder if some of the accounts of people having uh, immune responses or losing their allergies could be related to the fact that psychedelics block the immune uh, chain. <clears throat> and then, of course, in the new decade here, we have to say, that the Psychedelic Science Conference has to be a landmark in the development of this. The thing to notice, though, is how each of these categories has expanded, and we're getting more and more activity. And this is a limited selection, obviously. I've been biased in my selection. We could talk about some other things. But obviously, some things are starting to happen, some very positive things. So the three chemical types of psychedelics, and I'll use hallucinogens here too, <clears throat> interchangeably, are the phenethylamines, and the representative of this would be mescaline, and of course you have DOB, 2CB, all the 2CI, 2CT this and 2CT that. Those are all representatives of this uh, phenyl phenethylamine class. We have the tryptamines, and over here we'd have DMT, uh, psilocin, and psilocybin. 
5-methoxy-DMT would be the principal representatives in there. And of course, there are things where you've changed the R. You've got other things than methyl, isopropyl, ethyl, things like that. And these are generally active too, but that old class of tryptamines. And then the lysergamides, um, this pointer is fairly feeble, but uh, if this is a methyl, a CH3, and these are two ethyl groups, carbon, two carbon ethyl groups, then you have LSD, which is representative of the ergolines, and you can see that they're a special case of the tryptamines. You see the tryptamine fragment buried within LSD. LSD is uh, one of the most potent hallucinogens. The most potent one at this point is probably where we've changed this R from a methyl to an ethyl. It's a compound we developed years ago called ethylad. That's a little bit more potent than LSD. <coughs> A little harder to make, so you haven't seen it. <clears throat> the interesting thing about the discovery of LSD that most people don't appreciate is drugs like Prozac and drugs for migraine would not be there for you right now if, if you were on those drugs had it not been for the discovery of LSD. LSD was discovered in, 19, its effects were discovered in 1943, as probably everyone here knows. Serotonin was discovered almost contemporaneously, and <clears throat> There was no evidence that it was in the brain. In fact, the studies, um, the woman who established that it was present in the brain, the boss of her lab, Erwin Page, didn't believe that she'd find it in the brain. Because up to that time, um, if you had mental illness and schizophrenia, it was thought that you suffered from some nurturing deficit. Your mother had not uh, breastfed you properly or your toilet training had been screwed up or something like that. So <clears throat> when they found out that serotonin was in the brain, they suddenly said, well, LSD, we know LSD is a potent psychoactive compound. It's got this fragment that looks like serotonin. Maybe serotonin has something to do with behavior. Maybe neurochemistry has something to do with behavior. That sounds rather bizarre today, but in 1950, that was a very novel concept. The hypothesis that brain chemistry could affect behavior. And serotonin research was one of the big neuroscience areas. If you go back into the 1950s and early 60s, Serotonin was the neurotransmitter that everybody was looking at because of this connection between LSD and serotonin. <clears throat> uh, these are molecules of serotonin and psilocin where I've uh, minimized the shape using a computer and then these grids represent the actual surface of the molecule if you could see it in 3D. And what I've done is plot the electrostatic charges on top of that. So you can see a positive charge is blue, a negative charge is red. That may not show up real well in the light in here. But just to show you, there is a similarity between serotonin and psilocin, which is one of the tryptamines. <clears throat> so where do they work? The phenethylamines and tryptamines all activate serotonin 2A and 2C receptors and the 1A receptors for the tryptamines. LSD is a little more complex. <clears throat> We used to say that LSD was, had promiscuous pharmacology. <laughs> now what they say is it has rich pharmacology. The problem has been finding out how LSD works. So for those of you who took some algebra, you know that if you have a series of simultaneous equations, you can solve them for an unknown. Well, with the phenethylamines and the tryptamines, the 2A and 2C receptors are the things they have in common. And of course, with LSD, the 2A and the 2C receptor is what it has in common. The tryptamines and LSD also activate this other class of receptor, serotonin 1A receptor. So the, common, the commonality is, is activation of the 2A and the 2C receptors. And basically the consensus is that activation of the 2A serotonin 2A receptor is the essential component necessary but perhaps not sufficient for, I think it's working, it's just very feeble. <clears throat> is necessary, but maybe not sufficient for the full range of effects. And obviously, with the, all the other actions that LSD has at brain receptors, and these are all high affinity interactions. They're not just things that it sort of kind of touches. These are high affinity. It sticks pretty tightly. <clears throat> so the serotonin 2A receptor, once we discovered that, people started looking at that. Now, this is a very critical target in the brain. It's actually one of the key targets for atypical antipsychotic drugs like Risperdal and, and uh, uh, olanzapine and things that, uh, that are used to treat schizophrenia. It's located in areas that are very critical for normal cognitive function. <clears throat> if we look at a section of a human brain, this is a post-mortem brain, former psychedelic user, and what we did is, uh, I didn't do this, this study was, uh, a slice was incubated with a radioactive tritium labeled molecule uh, called ketanserin. Well, I think it just not, doesn't have enough amps or whatever, milliwatts. 
Ketanserin is a drug which binds to the serotonin 2A receptors and tight, binds tightly. So you can take this brain 